Thank you, everyone. I don't know how we can follow Annie. That was uh, an amazing uh, presentation, so thank you for that. And all the presentations, I really enjoyed them. I have to, uh, declaration of interest here, I know these guys very well. I have known uh, MDLF, the Media Development Loan Fund, that helped to set up, oh, the slides have gone too quickly. No, that's fine. Um, I uh, worked with MDLF for many years. Some of the slides in James's presentation of El Periodico and Malaysia Kini, uh, I helped MDLF work with those guys at the time when they were under extreme pressure from the Portillo government in Guatemala and from Mohamed Mahathir in, um, in Malaysia. And these guys were champions for freedom of expression. And that's what this organization really is all about. It's not about tools. Source Fabric sounds like it's about tools, and it is, but at the heart of it is freedom of expression. It's people who are taking a big risk to get the news out in places where disparate voices and different perspectives are not heard. So it's, I'm proud to be part of all of this. And on my, this is my study back home, and on the whiteboard I put down some of the things that I would cover in this uh, little talk. Um, this is some of the projects. I spend most of my time working in, around the world in countries where there's not much freedom of expression and um, where brave journalists are trying to set up media operations and helping them to build independent, sustainable media. And so let me just look at um, some of the things that I put down to cover today. I'm not going to go in all, into all of these because we've covered many. But the interest for media these days, for the media owners, it's to its revenue, distribution, its audience, costs, their unique differential they're looking for now. They need to have a unique differential, quality journalism, and it's the survival. For the market, it's also reach, inventory for the advertisers, new opportunities. For the journalists, what they need and what Source Fabric are building are tools that's intuitive and take the complexity away and let us do what we do well. Because we only do one thing as journalists, we find facts. We find facts that we then source, verify and attribute. And the facts that had it not been for us, the world would never have known. That's all we do. We add context and analysis, but that's all we do. We have facts. And increasingly today, what we need to think of is that our newsrooms have to be fact factories or content factories, delivering information to whatever device the user turns to in order to access information. That's all we do. And increasingly, the news organizations I'm working with around the world, in countries that the West would sniff at and think, oh, we know best. In these countries, you've got some of the most innovative, brave journalists who are doing things that the West is still to cotton on to. Now, um, I'm a great believer in the change of media being understood because we've, we've often sort of just thought we're journalists and we're professional journalists. You know, in, in some regions I work in, the bloggers are the real journalists. The professional journalists got lazy. Take the CIS and the Caucasus. The big state media, they got lazy. They just churned out news releases and went to parties. And slowly, slowly, a group of informed bloggers started to form who had a knowledge about the environment, about the economics, about human rights, and they started to blog with authority. It's what I call the middle media, taking over where lazy mainstream media failed. And mainstream media failed because they had the broadcast at model, the broadcast and publish at model. That's the model where we, the professional journalists, knew best. So we broadcast at the audience and we told them what to think. And you guys just sat there and had to listen to me because that's the broadcast and publish app model. Oops, going the wrong way, sorry. So, starts with radio. You tune in the radio, you listen to a radio show, you broadcast at. Then we went to TV. We turned up for the six o'clock news bulletin and you all sat down and you had a running order Decided by journalists sitting in White City in England, maybe, BBC headquarters or CNN, who said, oh, they need to know about these stories today, and we're professional, and we'll give it to them. And so they do. My mother-in-law, bless her heart, she's 84 years old, she still says, oh, it's six o'clock, we better listen to the news. And she and her husband sit by the TV and tune it in, as if there's no other news going on around the day, and, if, and that's all they want. They have to have their daily bulletin. But that model's dead. 
That model's dead. It's the model where people read a paper with no way of communicating about what they've found. There's no way of participating in that news. And what happens is, we the journalists serve them up a meal. And that meal they have to consume if they don't. The only choice is to put down the newspaper or to turn the TV or the radio off. They have no choice. So that model's dead. I think we all agree. The broadcast and publish app model is dead. So then we move to the engage with but on our terms model. That's in its death throes. The engage with on our terms model is in its death throes. And that's the model. I've been guilty with this. You know, when we built BBC News Online, we had a forum, a talking point. We'd pick the topics that people would talk about, and we'd only publish the responses that, people, that fitted in with what we wanted. I worked in BBC Radio. We'd have phone-in shows. We'd only put the guests on that we wanted, who talked about the things we wanted, and we'd cut the ones off that got a bit risky. So that was the one where we had letters to the editor, which we still monitored, we had radio phone-ins, we have TV, chat shows, but we still decide what they should do. Same with forums. There was still an amount of policing going on. It's still spoon-feeding the audience. It's still us knowing what's best. It's the arrogance of journalism. And you know what's lovely about social media? Is it's come along and it's pricked our bubble. It's told journalists, you're not the only ones that are smart, you're not the only ones that are connected. In fact, you're totally out of touch on many of the things, and unless you embrace us, your journalism is going to be hollow and shallow, and you'll lose your audiences. So we're now into the third model, which is the participate in model. And I like to call this the let loose to hold tight model, because when my grandmother saw me fretting over losing my girlfriend, she said, oh Dave, you were too possessive. You were too possessive, you should have let loose to hold tight. And then later, my girlfriend returned and we got married and she's my wife. But with the audience, this is the same. If you have an audience that you try and control in your little, little walled garden of a news experience, then you're going to lose them and they'll go elsewhere. And they'll probably go to the place that we all probably go, which is the social media space. The audience is out there with experiences, with wonderful, diverse perspectives irrespective of race, of, of, of affordability, of background, of gender, of sexual preference, they've got all these lovely, lovely perspectives that we often ignore because they don't fit our particular media outlet. We need to embrace that audience and bring them in. Now, what mainstream media needs to do is get away from regurgitating the wires and press releases and news releases and turning out the same old, same old that everyone else does. And it does happen. When I was working as a consultant with Al Jazeera, I did an interview with the AFP. I was in Doha, and we just launched the coverage of the Gaza uh, dispute over on Live Station, which is a live television platform on the internet. And the interviewer was to ask me, what were the stats? Simple question. So I did the interview with the AFP, and the next morning I googled my name, Live Station, Al Jazeera, and I uh, found 10 pages of results coming in. Of those pages, there were almost word-for-word copy-paste headlines from the most diverse news organizations, such as um, Arabic news organizations, Israeli news organizations, Western um, news organizations in England, in America, all using the same copy-paste. Now, the media cannot afford to do that anymore. They need to go for the dis differential. They need to concentrate on what they do that no one else does, or how they do it. They need to then put their products, so the facts. We need to put the facts out for the audience to come along, rather like a supermarket. We put facts that are fresh. Had it not been for us, the world would never have known. They're facts that the audience can rely on. They're trustworthy. And the facts take, the, the audience then gets those facts, takes them away to their preferred social media space, engages with their own audience, and if we've won their trust, comes back to us with those perspectives. And that's the holistic round approach. And that's what I'm hoping the guys here at Source Fabric are going to be building. Now, this needs a complete change in attitude of the media chiefs, the editors in chief. Um, the, there's data behind the reason for this. This changing audience behavior has got massive implications for all of us. Uh, this is a year old, this data. This is the Pew Center for um, American Life Project research, which was done last year. You've probably all seen these figures. I'll go through them very quickly. But it was showing that the audience demand for news now is through a new relationship with us, the journalists. They want news that's portable, 
uh, personalized and participatory. That's what they require. And of that participatory, 37% of internet users on mobile, this is last year, have contributed to the creation of news, the dissemination of the news through Facebook or Twitter, or commented on it. So the audience participation is, is in great demand. And going back to my mother-in-law, there's only 7% in America last year were still getting their news from one single source in a day. So maybe the TV bulletin or the radio or the internet. But 46% get their news from four to six different platforms. That means that all the news organizations we work with and we represent need to become content factories, delivering their content to whatever device the users tend to to access information. <clears throat> now, what this also means, the Pew Research, you can download it, it's some fascinating data, and although it's a year old, it really gives us some clues the way the audience is moving. Um, what it what I think it sums up, and it's about 40 pages long on a PDF, but what I think it sums up is that the days of loyalty to a particular news organization on one particular piece of technology in one particular form are probably gone. So those of us who have not hedged our bets and who just pump out our material on TV, radio, or print it in a newspaper are taking a massive risk because the audience has moved to another place. So all we do as journalists, I'm sure you all agree, we produce facts. Sourced, verified, attributed facts immediately. We don't hold them back. I don't know if you, those in print know how it works. It, it, you, you get your facts, you hold them back until your next publication. That's all changed. You know, I was looking at the whole Gaddafi story yesterday on The Guardian, The Telegraph, um, on, my, on the internet here, and they had the live blogging. In a, but go back a year, they wouldn't have dreamed of having the news broken on the online before the print because it would affect their sales, except they've recognized the audience moved to a different place, farm it out to the audience, win the trust, the audience comes back, and it's all part of them building a new business model. So we need to get the facts out immediately in ways that are reusable and multi-device. If I go to a website now where I can't share a story or comment on it, or add my pennyworth and share it with my peer group, I don't go back again because it's limiting my participation. We need to target the right people for maximum use. So know our target audience, know their needs, know what keeps them awake at night worrying and attack those issues, tackle them, tackle them by including them through the social media side. And I go back to the point that uh, the whole reason we exist as journalists is that we must discover information that had it not been for us, the world would never have known. And then put that out on every device people turn to. So to do that, here's the super desk. Now I'm building these, not building them, I just go and talk about them and other people build them. But this is a command and control system of how you can make a news organization into a, a multi-platform content factory. It's an efficient news machine that gives you a much better focus on your core editorial proposition, your differential, what you do that no one else does. It gives you improved quality control, it gives you much faster speed of delivery, and it saves resources and costs. Also, it creates new products. The way it works is this. It's rather like we go out to, as journalists, to find our facts. It's like um, someone going out to take the raw material. Let's, let's take wood. So we go and get our, the best wood we can and we bring it into the news operation, and then we produce it. We make products out of that wood, and then the wood then, the products are sold to the audience, the customers. So if you take that metaphor and go back to journalism, we find facts, we add value to the facts, we add context and analysis and diverse opinions through our social networking, and then we create different products, maybe mobile, maybe iPad, maybe a newspaper, maybe a broadcast. But Broadcasters have got to stop thinking of themselves as broadcasters and publishers as publishers. They've got to think as content factories. And the way this works is you have a central desk somewhere in the newsroom where all the key editorial decisions are made and a number of key players sit around this desk. It can be a physical desk or it can be a proximity of chairs. Or as in Vietnam where I've been working, it can be virtual with screens representing Hanoi, Hue, Han Da Nang and Ho Chi Minh City. And what happens is the key editorial decisions breathe the same news air or virtually. So they know everything that's going on. You have an intake editor who knows everything that's going on in the news outside of the building. And they give the alerts of what's coming up and what's happening. 
You have the output editors sitting in the same space. You have a planning editor who's responsible for planning ahead the stories you're covering and a resource production manager to make sure there's the, uh, the people to do the stories. That all goes to one side and then you have your production units. And the production units can be whatever you're delivering to. And the production units then add the appropriate value for the platform they're responsible for. And then that is sent back to the super desk who check quality control and send it out to the audience on whatever device they're using. A simple workflow model. But going back, it, it's just like any factory. The raw material comes in. With us, it's facts. It's produced. With us, it's added context, analysis, pictures, graphics, whatever. And then it's put into different products. So this is the Superdesk model. And um, I know the Source Fabric team are looking at this philosophy as part of a development of the tools they're offering. Tools, free tools for media in need. Fantastic, in any country. And, and these guys are building it based on this philosophy of a content factory. Here's the one in Zimbabwe I'm working with. Uh, Alpha Media Holdings is uh, not the only, but what used to be the only independent media house in Zimbabwe. Um, they have a daily newspaper called Newsday. They have a financial weekly called the Zimbabwe Independent, and this one comes out on a Friday. And they have a Sunday family newspaper called The Standard, which comes out on a Sunday. And they were in different newsrooms with different teams doing different stories, not sharing resources. They had a web team in another room just piecing together little bits of news just to try and make a website. There was no... There was no convergence, so we've converged it. Um, here's the model. It's based on this little bit here in the middle is like um, a little coffee table. Uh, in the coffee table, the journalists are supposed to, they're still building this, sit with their backs to it. They face out to the desks and all their teams. But when the news breaks, they can spin round and have a little meeting, breathe the same air, decide what's the appropriate platform for the maximum impact of that information on the target audience. And that's a decision they can make as the news is developing. At the top of, at the, uh, inside the whole of newsroom is the online desk, central to it, not in another room on a different floor run by non-journalists, which sometimes happens. Then you have the different sections. And above are the editors of the different brands. Now, the big fear about this was that by bringing everyone together, that you would dilute the differential of the brands. And they're very protective. Each has a different style. No, it didn't, actually. They learned to cross-promote. They learned to feed off each other's news and do it in a different way for their own target audience using a different newspaper or on the websites that were being consumed by that audience and on mobile. So... This has been, this is a work in progress. Uh, they're still working on the, they've done two stages so far. They've made savings on the business desk. They've made savings on the sports desk and the general desk because you bring everyone together. And it means that you end duplication and reverse, reverse, reversioning and you save resources. Um, Vince is the editor in chief and he gave me a quote for this session. He was saying, I said, well, how did the super desk go? And he said, well, there's no one way of doing it, but I found that the best way is just get on with it. And he said, but what he's found is that he's released the energy of the group to produce better content. Now, some would have said, you bring all that together, you're going to produce much worse content. It's just going to be vanilla. You're just going to actually destroy the brands. But no, he's saved the energy of the group to build better content. In um, Georgia, in Tbilisi, there's an organization called Politra. This is their super desk. Very similar. They're still building it, but they were great. I went there and suggested this during a strategy session. And the Iraqli, the, the, the boss said, can you come to my place today, tonight? I said, yeah. So they drove me over to Politra newsroom. And he said, okay, if we build your super desk, we move that desk there, we move those chairs there. We, we can start working differently. Start moving the chairs. It was just about moving chairs. I've been in media organizations where to come up with an idea like this, you'd have six months of a committee formed writing reports to be considered and procrastination would be brought into the situation. You'd never do anything. But in Zimbabwe and in Georgia and in Vietnam, they do it immediately because they're smarter than us and they realize that they know their audience better. The audience has moved to a different place and they need to connect because unless they do, they're going to be in big trouble. So this is the political one, very similar. 
It's everyone breathing the same news air. The seats in blue are the influential seats. The section editors, the output editor, the intake editor, the planning editor, they are the ones that make the main calls. They're, they're the protectors of the brand, if you like, and they've got to be talking together. And the interesting thing was how you find, how this leads to story exploitation you would never have thought before. I did my first super desk in Belgrade in 2001 with a news agency called Beta News, and they moved the desks. And we did a mock-up, we did a paper pilot of how we'd do a story. And it was David Beckham moved to Real Madrid. And David Beckham was really pleased to move to Real Madrid, but Posh Spice, his wife, wasn't that fussed about going to Real Madrid, but she was getting used to it. So, we had an entertainment desk, a sports desk, a financial desk, a general news desk, totally separate. We brought the editors onto a super desk and we said, how do we do the Beckham Real Madrid story? Oh, it's a sports story. It's a financial story. It's the biggest transfer. It's an entertainment story. Posh Spice doesn't want to go. It's a general news story. What do we do? We breathe the same news air, and each editor gets their team to add one paragraph of the main story for the general news, and then do a specialist sidebar on the other angle of the story, all by having a super desk. It wouldn't have happened before. In Vietnam, this guy's great, um, Lee Quan. Dui, a uh, good friend of mine, um, he introduced the Superdesk, as I say, with um, Hanoi, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Hue and Da Nang um, being satellite officers. They have a virtual wall with screens and they can um, Skype in and have their morning meeting all through the day. He said his Superdesk has saved unnecessary costs, it's improved the efficiency of the news organization, but very Vietnamese. It's given us a command and control. They love the military idea of it. They love the precision and the fact that it makes them more effective. So, finally, just going through a few slides. It's not costly. Building a super desk is not going to cost you more money. These are, these are the things that it's not. It's not going to be disruptive. Just move a few chairs. It's about an attitude of mind. It's not going to be hard work. Because the journalists will be given jobs to do that are far more enriching. You'll probably do fewer stories. But the stories you do will be much more focused on your target audience needs, on the issues that keep them awake at night, and far more likely to resonate with that audience and be shared in their social network space and add perspectives. And it's not going to damage. It's not going to damage your business. It's not a destruction process. What it is, it's the way ahead. It's the only way ahead. It's the only way ahead for us to go into the content factory strategy. It's going to make us money. It's going to save us costs. It's going to help us do better quality control. We fine tune our journalism so that it has a differential and it's not like the masses that are going out through the wires fed media. It's going to be, we're going to force our journalists to do a much better product. And it's going to take us into the future. This is the only way we can find new business opportunities and survive. And I was, at lunchtime, I was sitting on my laptop and a tweet came in and I thought I'd share it with you because it's very important to this uh, session. This is from Journalism Co UK today, just this lunchtime. The Times editor signals a shift to integrated production. And the Times says, we want to stop the duplication of production between print, iPad, website, and most recently Android. So journalists now at the Times are going to be expected to be multi-platform journalists working in a multimedia environment, delivering to multiple devices. And that's just happened. Now, it's a big shame that they couldn't have done this 10 years ago. Because if they'd have done this 10 years ago, they'd be way ahead of the game. They've done it now as a cost-saving measure, which is fine. Um, and it, it, it will save them money. But it will also make them more effective and more efficient. And I'm really hoping that uh, Source Fabric continues to build Superdesk. I hope that it'll be the first tool that exists to make every news operation in the world we work in to make them an effective content factory delivering to multiple devices. So thank you for um, listening and um, I'll take any questions if there's time. Um, there is a little time. L shall we take yeah, two or three questions if there are any? I just want to thank you again for this. I always like the fact in which physical movement actually ex ch uh, changes the actual social structure and the products related to this. Um, mm. It's always Im impressive to see these um, effects. There's a question here in the first row. Uh, you said that... <coughs> Hello? 
Yeah, you said that it's not hard work. No. But then you went on to say that you journalists have to be multi-platform. They have to do iPad, i this, and internet, and uh, phones, and yeah. you know. So how does that work out? So um, all you all you do is you know you're Janice, We could spend hours talking about subject, verb, object, who, why, when, where, what, how. Inverted pyramid journalism. Actually, the inverted pyramid journalism that I learned about on my first day in the newspaper journalist many years ago is the ideal solution for digital world because every paragraph can be tweeted, is, 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 can be deconstructed. And we used to do inverted pyramid journalism. So if the advertising uh, department came in and said, oh, we've got an advert for the front page, the story could be cut, cut at any point and still make sense. And that's the ideal solution for digital journalism. So in terms of hard work, we build the tools that make the work so much easier. All the journalist has to do is verify the facts, find and verify the facts, and put them down. Now, if Sava and the team can build us tools where we just write the facts as we find them, and they make a beautiful um, display on uh, iPad, we need, of course, to in integrate all these tools, but it's, it's not going to be extra hard work. I can promise you. When I was at CNN, we built a system called multi-platform authoring that from one journalist's content could deliver to 10 revenue generating devices at the press of the save button. And that was all about an editorial discipline of character limited fields based on the basic essentials of subject, verb, object and inverted pyramid journalism, which works for the digital space as it does for the old print. Any more questions? Uh, how do you deal with the uh, fact-checking issue? Uh, you know, technology certainly has helped us uh, gather more data, but the, the, the investigation still is a big issue. It takes yeah. a lot of time. Um, is, the, is the super desk considering that area of investigation yes. and the cost? So what you do is, as you look at your um, current use of resources, we'd sit down and we'd say, are we really meant to be doing those stories that are down the list of stories? Are we churning out too many stories that don't really matter? And should we th uh, put those resources, those journalists, into fact-checking, into ve investigative journalism, into doing high-quality multimedia packages on every story that can resonate across every device and, and link between them? And also stories that we can deconstruct, stories that we can find every element. Because, you know, I, I love, there's a tool I found, I was telling Sava, called Guzi where um, it's like a little post-it note you can put in a web story at the paragraph that means something to you, or the one sentence, and then you can expand on it and tweet it, and when you find it, people come to the point. Now, we don't do that enough in journalism. We don't deconstruct the information into every possible use it could have for our target audience. Now, in terms of resources, we could, and fact-checking, we could, if we start doing many of the stories we're currently doing, which is often just copy-paste wires, and we start investing in more time spent on the stories that really matter and display our differential, then we're, it's far more rewarding for the journalists, and it plays into the whole part of fact-checking. 